One of William Burroughs' very last diary entries. Fact. Cannabis stimulates visual centers in the brain. I have got so many excellent images from cannabis. A few drags on the green tit, and I can see multiple ways out and beyond. So why all this heat on this harmless and rewarding substance? Who are these anti-drug freaks? Who are you to whom truth is so dangerous? Me, I have no moral qualms about smoking pot at all. I just can't handle it, especially the chronic and the wheelchair varietals available today. I remember touring with my punk band in the early 80s. We were staying at a certain hotel where we were to play. I was feeling under the weather, so I toked up and took to my bed with a copy of Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. As I opened the book to read, I could hear the warm-up band start their set in the bar downstairs right below my room. When they wrapped their set one hour later, I found I was still on the title page. So, while I may accept claims for Weed's creative stimulus to writers, I'll warn you right now, Weed and reading don't mix. The plain fact is that uh, uh, none of us know very much about this drug in any uh, uh, verifiable way. Well, Bill, it's been about two hours since you got the drug. How do you feel? Fantastic. Defiant? Not at all. Business-like? Not at all. Sheesh. Friendly. Uh, extreme. This is so ridiculous. Would you be interested in taking part in a study like this again and having oh. the same type of drug? Sure. You would. It's been Any? a very pleasant experience for you. I'll do it any time you want. Do you think it would be any time at all? Do you think this it would call be me any time of the day or night? We found out that the drug makes people happy. It makes them intoxicated and finally makes them sleepy, which is about what marijuana users were telling us happened all the time. Well, you knew that already, right? Hello, welcome to the show. I'm Daniel Richler. Now, you might be high right now, or you might be resolutely stoned, but either way, I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, ah, I've heard it all before, there really is no debate over pot at all. But I think that you and I will both learn quite a bit from our invited guests on this show, uh, what you might call professional researchers in the field of weed. Now, lest you think that that smells like a pot advocacy show, let me hasten to tell you that we did invite many critics of decriminalization. The Toronto Police Association, the Halton Regional Police Chief, who is also the president of the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police. We invited the York Regional Police Chief, anyone from the York Regional Vice Squad. Several of these people signed this letter to Prime Minister Paul Martin, saying that loosening of marijuana possession laws will come at a price for our society. But none would come on this show to tell us exactly what that price might be. Now, no doubt, some of them had their daughter's weddings to attend. But in the end, I must conclude that they're not confident enough of their cause to debate with my other guests. And so, hey, they snooze, they lose. Let's begin with Alan N. Young, law professor at University of Toronto, reading from his new book, Justice Defiled, Perverts, Potheads, Serial Killers, and Lawyers. Once you recognize the law's destructive potential, keeping the law within narrow boundaries becomes a political imperative. It should extend only to target behavior that is seriously harmful to others. It should never be used as a tool of moral hygiene. The state has only one true mandate with respect to criminal justice, to protect citizens and provide the infrastructure for orderly relations. Beyond that, the state should not stray. True democracy and freedom encompass the freedom to construct one's own heaven or hell. 
The state should have nothing to say about our choice of girl or boyfriends, or our choice of diet, or our artistic proclivities, or our choice of intoxicants. Some people will hump themselves to death or intoxicate themselves into oblivion, but that is no business of the state unless the excess decadence truly hurts an innocent third party. Morris, obviously, who was... Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Hello, and welcome back. New York-based High Times magazine recently rated Vancouver the best international destination for both tolerance and availability of pot. Amsterdam made number two on the list, and so we thought we'd better check it out. We asked Dana Larson, editor of Cannabis Culture magazine, to give us a tour of the highest place on Earth, West Hastings Street, Vancouver. Cannabis Culture is a magazine that covers the cannabis culture in the form of marijuana and hemp and all the things that are happening around the world. I get lots of letters now from people whose lives have been changed by the magazine or who have never seen it before and they, they can finally relate to they've been hiding their whole life or something. They come to a place like this, they read our magazine and they realize they're part of a larger family. It's something that I can go anywhere in the world and if I can find some marijuana smokers, we have something in common. We're part of the same group. We'll f have the same rituals. You pass a joint in a circle. You know, these are things that, that really bypass or, or or are beyond the traditional national boundaries. One mind-blowing way of looking at it is not only can everything around us that isn't glass or metal be made out of hemp, but also there's 66, at least 66 cannabinoids. And there's no reason not to think that each one of them is medically effective in a certain way. Cannabis is a very complex plant. It's not just THC. There's lots of different cannabinoids, different strains of different effects. Some types of cannabis will wake you up and give you energy. Others will relax you, make you go to sleep. Others will you know, stimulate you intellectually. Others might be more physical. From one end down to the other, it's all cannabis-friendly businesses. And sometimes when I'm walking down to work or walking nearby, I can smell the marijuana from a block or two away. This is really what I feel is the heart of, of the marijuana culture on this block. This is the BC Marijuana Party store. This is the same location as what used to be the Hemp BC store. And the Hemp BC store was really the first one. Before that, there was nothing else here of, of this kind. And it's kind of good being a political party, because unlike a regular business, you don't have to have a business license to operate a storefront as a political party. So it allows us, being the registered BC Marijuana Party, allows us to get away with some things and bypass some of the ways that City Hall can mess with you by not giving you a business license or things like that. And also in this location we have the Pot TV studios where we produce our, our shows for Pot TV and as you were hearing earlier we've got over four million shows have been viewed. There's thousands of shows archived on there for public viewing at any time. These things are all part of a great program to, to push the cannabis issue forward in every way possible. You know, I believe this is one of the greatest civil rights issues of our time, and uh, it's, it's certainly something that can be changed quite easily within our lifetime, and we have the cultural impetus to start actually making these changes in our society. And back in Toronto, I introduce to you Alan Young, author of Justice Defiled, Perverts, Potheads, Serial Killers, and, of course, Lawyers. lawyers. How do you do? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, there are so many interesting uh, facts, factoids, pieces of history, legislation, and so on in this book that I actually was quite unaware of. Uh, among them, the definition and the origin of the scapegoat. Tell us about the Hebrews and the ancient Greeks and the, and the farm, what was it, pharmakos? Pharmakos. All ancient societies had to come up with some explanation for disasters and tragedies, whether it's crop failure or disease. Human beings don't do well with inexplicable phenomena. So traditional societies would elect or appoint someone to be the scapegoat, and Greek uh, society was called the pharmakos. And once a year, twice a year, they drive the scapegoat out of the cities. It'd be a big ritual, and the idea was the scapegoat would take all the sins of the population 
and walk into the wilderness and the sins of the people would be absorbed into the scapegoat and therefore crop failures wouldn't occur or infant mortality wouldn't occur. And this is a, a recurring phenomenon throughout history, whether it's the Jewish people in Eastern Europe or whether it was the witches during the medieval days. And I assert it's now the drug users in the 20th century. And it's interesting that the word pharmakos, which is scapegoat in Greek, became the etymological root of pharmacology. That does sound ironical. Is that a coincidence? Or, or? Well, it's something Thomas Zaz uh, actually pointed out. It's not something that I independently researched, and I was quite surprised to see the connection. It probably is just a coincidence, but one of those very telling coincidences. Where were you when we were getting high to quote uh, Oasis? Uh, <laughs> what I mean is, in your book, you talk about yeah. growing up yes. and, and uh, seeing that uh, LBJ, for example, had um, uh, uh, started the, the war on poverty, something abandoned. Yes. Uh, and we, are, we have to settle with the war on drugs today. You know, what, what is this war on thing? Well, the war on poverty was probably the only worthwhile war to pursue ever. And as you said, LBJ announced it and Richard Nixon changed it once they moved out of Vietnam. They started removing their soldiers into the war on drugs. There always seems to need, for certain countries, especially the United States, less Canada, there has to be an enemy. Enemies unify the population. So right now, the enemy is ourselves, our own people. We are segregating a certain sector of society, saying, you are drug users, you are creating the destruction of our society, urban decay as a result of your behavior, crime as a result of your behavior, low uh, grades in school are a result of your behavior. So we've declared a war on a certain type of people, drug users, because we naively believe if we eradicate the drug users, deter people from ever using drugs, all these other social problems will simply go away. It's just another war that's of no value to anybody. You use a pretty strong language in this book. Uh, one of the words uh, that pops up quite frequently is hysterical, as in regards to uh, hysterical claims to sure. justify the law. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of claims were made uh, in uh, Canada to justify anti-pot legislation over the years? Pretty much the same claims in the United States. They're interchangeable. You would go insane. You would kill your mother. You'd have sex with your father. Oh, wait, wait. This is on the law books, or this was a rhetoric? Or, you know, it's interesting. It was the first female judge. Emily Murphy, the first woman we ever appointed in Canada to sit on the bench, she wrote a series of articles in Maclean's magazine that were all taken from LAPD files. And the idea was, you smoke this plant substance, you will go insane, you will kill all your family, and you will end up in, in a psychiatric institution. And that pretty much was the gospel truth until the 50s, when people started to actually smoke pot. Because the funny thing was, in 1920, when we started saying this, nobody was smoking pot. It really wasn't an issue. But in any event, uh, it's it's been hysteria throughout. We see it today. We don't have to go back to 1920. We see it today. Right now, the police with uh, grow ops, hydroponic grow ops, they can't simply say it's against the law. They're saying it's endangering our children because there's toxic molds in the houses. Well, hey, people have been growing tomatoes hydroponically in their homes. No one's ever talked about toxic mold. Whenever you have a law which doesn't have a sound political foundation, you have to create the foundation. And the foundation is best based on hysteria because people pay attention to hysterical claims. Uh, in this chair here, we have the Halton uh, police chief, uh, in spirit anyway, and, and I just wanted to ask him what he had to say about this. Okay, very interesting. And uh, so t tell me more about, about the, the, the literature. What I hear over the years, again and again, any time any mention of decriminalization comes up is, not enough studies have been done. And I think it's very sensible that we be cautious about sure. this, for heaven's sake. Have studies been done? Have sufficient studies been More done? More money has been spent on investigating the medical harms associated with marijuana than any other product. It's gone through what, for drug approval, would be phase one, two, and three of all clinical trials. We know what the true side effects are, and they're pretty benign. They're really quite weak. We keep saying there are other things because we see the illness and trauma being created in rats, in rat studies, where we overdose rats and they develop leukemia. So we say suspicion of leukemia for pot smokers. The reality is none of those claims are ever replicated in human populations. And the reality is now we've been smoking pot, at least in Western society, pretty steadily for 30, 40 years. We'd see epidemiological evidence to support those claims. People would start going to hospitals with some of the indications like immune impairment, uh, reproductive impairment that everyone's claimed they've seen in rats. We're not seeing it in human populations. In but, but, 1992, uh, 152 people were admitted to the hospital for marijuana. That's a spit in the bucket. But Alan, every uh Reggae fan knows that Bob Marley died of cancer of the foot. His big toe or his entire left foot was removed yes. because obviously a, a cancerous 
tumor, sure. uh, the result of smoking a pound of marijuana every day. You know, I mean, it's well, I, I don't think there's necessarily a causal link there. I've never actually heard that, and I've never actually heard any evidence of marijuana even being causally re related to lung cancer. Mm -hmm. It does create chronic bronchial impairment. It'll make you a wheezer. It'll make you a cougher. But no one's actually been able to show it leads to even lung cancer because all the studies are confounded by the fact most people are smoking cigarettes at the same time that they're going in for the studies. So the reality is, uh, you can always point to a tragedy. Bob Marley died at a young age. Uh, we were talking earlier about Benji Hayward jumping into Lake Ontario because of LSD. You can always find a tragedy. The mistake in society is to extrapolate from a single event and say it's a uniform, consistent pattern. And that's what the state does all the time with drugs. And it's very distressing because it's really just a uh, foundation built on lies. Speaking of the state, uh, before he became Prime Minister, Paul Martin was making some noises about decriminalization in Canada, and uh, we don't hear as much about that now. Uh, not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but was there U.S. pressure on the Canadian government? There's been enormous U.S. pressure, and uh, in fact, Liberal MPs have been traveling back and forth between Washington to consult. We have a decriminalization bill on table, which is so watered down and diluted, it doesn't achieve its purpose, and one has to speculate its American influence, or just our politicians are foolish. They're both both plausible scenarios. I don't know which one is, is the true case. Well, you said speculate. I have to press you for harder information than that, but we have to break for a commercial for a brief moment, and we will be back with more. Prince Edward Island was the first to introduce prohibition in 1901. Then the World War I comes along, and it's a, an environment in which national efficiency and commitment to the war effort is the new argument that the temperance movement raises, and every province but Quebec introduces some prohibition legislation. Unlike the United States, we let breweries keep on producing. It was perfectly legitimate for Molson's or Labatt's or any of those companies to say, we're making full-strength beer to be sold in Mexico or Cuba. And in fact, that little rowboat that appeared at the docks uh, to, on Lake Ontario to take away our beer is going to Havana, really. Well, that rowboat was heading for the United States or perhaps out to the middle of the lake and then back into a Canadian port uh, or, you know, a little harbor someplace where they could smuggle it in. So they were quite complicit in the whole process of, of uh, bootlegging and rum running. Alcohol is, was, as I said, for, for centuries seen as a, as a medicine. And so when prohibition comes in, part of the legislation, including in the local option legislation, part of the legislation says doctors should have the right to prescribe it. So in Ontario, for example, they have the right to prescribe at, on one prescription a quart as a quart of, uh, of liquor or any kind of alcohol. Someone would show up at a doctor's office saying, I have a really sore throat and uh, you know, I've been coughing and I really think I need something with alcohol in it to help me. And the fact that it was the 23rd of December and uh, perhaps a lot of other people have been in recently with sore throats, we'll just overlook that. <laughs> and uh, by 1922-23, there were seven or 800,000 of these prescriptions being written in Ontario. So. This is all official. This is sort of official bootlegging, if you like. <laughs> and there you have Craig Heron, author of this book, Booze, drawing a certain parallel, I think we can understand, with what might seem impossible today, and that is the decriminalization of marijuana. I, I welcome into the studio Robin Ellens, proprietor of the Friendly Stranger uh, Hemp and what paraphernalia and accessory store? Or how Cannabis you it? culture shop. Thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> uh, Robin, can you uh, imagine? It seems impossible right now, uh, but can you imagine a society in which maybe one, you know, went to the corner store to buy the uh, R.J. Reynolds tobacco, uh, Acapulco Gold, king-sized, uh, ultra-mild filter light? Yes and no. First of all, I don't think we want the government involved in growing our cannabis. Uh, I really think that the cannabis culture wants to look after itself, wants to be able to grow its own at home uh, and maybe distribute that or buy it from a place that is licensed to sell it. But uh, I don't think we want Big Brother involved in... Uh, I didn't say government, I said R.J. Reynolds, so, you know, in other words, corporations. What's wrong with that? They go, they, they, go, they go hand in hand. I mean, there's a lot of money that changes hands both ways there. And uh, I really think this could be uh, an easily regulated industry uh, and 
But well, what I was talking about was was one in which marijuana was legitimate, that they were it was taxed, you know, that there were quality controls, that it was available not to minors, that it was removed, in fact, from the criminal neighborhood. Uh, what do you think, Alan? Is it is it possible? Is it what, what you would about, like to see? It's all about money. Money makes the world go round. I hate to say it. Everybody knows that marijuana is a benign substance, and we should decriminalize or legalize. Why do we? Not have, everybody. Well, you know what? Let me let me rephrase that. As arrogant as this is going to sound, all informed observers, people who actually read the literature and don't just listen to the hysteria. Now, why do we have casinos all over Ontario? Because the provinces needed money in the 1990s. When we hit that cash crunch again, that huge deficit. That's when they'll start talking about the potential of legalizing marijuana, <laughs> when they need the money from it. Right now, it's sort of a, a back burner issue. We want to make the law a bit more lenient because it's affecting our young people, but we don't want to offend the Americans. So we're trying to make everybody happy and nobody's happy. But when they need money, that's when you'll see marijuana hit the streets. A reference was made in that clip to medicinal booze. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we've all heard about medicinal marijuana. What is the status of that in Canada right now? Well, uh, Medicinal cannabis is still a uh, prohibited substance. Uh, there are certain individuals in the country that do have permits to have cannabis legally, uh, but it's a very small percentage of the people who really require it. And as far as obtaining this herb, it's not something they can uh, really get directly from the government, although the government has come through and delivered pot to a few of these people. Mm. Uh, it's just there's so much red tape and so much bureaucracy between the people who need cannabis medicinally and the ability to get the cannabis uh, that that needs to be addressed. There's no question about it. So you don't accept a doctor's script in your store? <laughs> no, we don't fill prescriptions at this stage in the game, no. You know, a a another uh, thing we keep hearing about that sounds, I don't know if it's tangential or associated, is hemp. And just to introduce this topic, I'd like to show you a brief clip from Chuck Klosterman and his stand-up routine. He's the author of Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> Here's Chuck Klosterman. I always have this thing that, like, a lot of times people write about hemp, and their thesis is always like, hemp is good for making rope. You know, it's like, I don't want to legalize pot to pull things. I want to smoke it. I mean, I don't, I don't understand why people are always trying to tell us how we can use hemp to like build a piano or whatever. You know? <laughs> Robin, come clean. Uh, you know, uh, I don't hear people getting as worked up over, you know, flax. I mean, flax could be a major industry. Yeah, but, but flax has never been prohibited under the criminal code. Uh, in Canada, we are now licensed to grow industrial hemp. Uh, but the real reason behind all this reefer madness and the smokescreen of marijuana uh, back in the 20s when they did prohibit it was the fact that hemp was the only fiber crop that could compete with tree-based paper. It's the only fiber crop that could uh, produce textiles, uh, cordage that wasn't synthetic. Um, Honestly, this was blackballed and, and put out of view of the general population and removed from the farmer's fields. Uh, and honestly, it's the missing link. This is the number one biomass producer on the planet. Hemp can produce more fiber per acre than any other plant we could possibly grow in this country, yet it's been prohibited for the last 70 plus years. Okay, I, I know on, on Lake Memphis, Magog, where I spent my teens in Quebec, there once was a major hemp industry in the making of sailcloth ships in the, what, the 18th century. Um, but come on, come clean. It's, it's really just to put pot in the mainstream that you're, that you're interested in, no? I don't believe so. Well, uh, can I clear up one thing up? Sure, sir. Male and female plants. Is there a difference here in regards to hemp and what you can smoke and get high on? Well, it's the female plant that people smoke when it comes to marijuana. But you have to remember that hemp really isn't the same thing as marijuana. Although it's grown from the same seed, the manner in which it's grown doesn't produce the active ingredients that you would smoke uh -huh. in the end. Okay, uh, It's grown much closer together in the field. It fights for the light and produces a, a stock that we take the fiber from. All right. So, in other words, there's no vested interest? No. I don't believe there is. What do you help think? normalize the plant. I mean, th this is a plant. That's the funny thing about this criminal law. We're, we're attacking a plant. So growing hemp, which would be environmentally sound, will help normalize cannabis as a plant. And now I only have one thing to say about hemp. Four acres of clear cutting is required to produce one acre of hemp paper. So, I mean, when I go to Vancouver Island and I see those clear-cut forests, I mean, I know that we need to start growing hemp. Mm. So it is a valuable industrial fiber, industrial product. We should be encouraging its cultivation regardless of what we do with marijuana. But I'm hoping, and I worked on the first hemp license in Canada in 1996, and I will admit that was my 
uh, hidden agenda was to get a lot of <laughs> marijuana looking plants growing in southwestern Ontario. I thought that would be a good aesthetic for southwestern Ontario. Hey. <laughs> In your, in your book, Justice Defiled, you, you talk about the United States uh, and, and their attitude. And I was thinking, is it not true that at least a dozen U.S. states have already decriminalized marijuana to some extent? In the 1970s, when everyone was realizing that this was a misguided policy, 11 states did decriminalize Oregon, California, I think Alaska, I can't remember. It doesn't really matter because the United States have this weird system where there's a federal criminal law. So even though in Oregon you might just get a traffic citation, if the feds decide to charge you, you're in big trouble because they're very draconian, very harsh there. It's the same thing with medical marijuana. There's a bunch of states that now allow for medical use of marijuana, but federal law steps in and they're arresting doctors in California. The United States is a very schizophrenic country when it comes to their drug policy because they're are lots of activists and lots of states that want to change the law but Congress and the federal government and George Bush and the people in power for reasons that I can't explain will not give up on this failed war I hate to interrupt you right there but we actually have to stop for a moment when we return Governor General's award-winning uh, author uh, Russell Smith will join us we're going to get a little less theoretical a little less legalistic and talk about actual stoner culture through the ages to the present day if we can remember to do so <laughs> Is an bummer now, and nobody knows where she's at. She could be almost anywhere. Maybe someday she'll be back. She started smoking. If you become a pothead, you risk blowing the most important time of your life, your teenage. That unrepeatable time for you to grow up and to prepare for being an adult that can handle problems and make something meaningful out of life. Or you have the choice to have the courage to see and deal with the world for what it really is. Far, far from perfect, but for you and for me. The only one I got to tell you, we're getting the giggles here. I mean, <laughs> didn't he hit a tree? You know? um, uh, welcome back. Look, I made a mistake before when I, I got a little over excited introducing Russell Smith. He was not a winner of the Governor General's Award for Literature, but a runner up uh, nominee. And welcome Thank on you. the show. Uh, your new, new book, Muriela Pent, is actually not on this topic at all, but I thought I'd mention it because you were so kind Thank to you. come on the show. Uh, perhaps you can tell us about some of the pot-like literature you have written. Or, or, well, I've, um, written, I've written a number of stories about drug use, not uh, only uh, pot, but hard drugs of, of various kinds. I just had a story in, uh, in this uh, small literary quarterly called the Queen Street Quarterly about, uh, uh, about heavy drug use. It's legal to write about it. Oh, okay, we're going to get to that. I wanted to ask about that later. But before I ask my, my next question, I, I just want to tell you that we did a little research and we found that there are a great many synonyms for marijuana, Mary Jane, weed, etc., Keith, what have you. And we're going to roll them across the screen while I ask the next question. And the purpose of this is to demonstrate that when language pervades to a certain degree, the way we speak every week, every day, it indicates a certain normalization, a certain universality that the law might not be recognizing and sends a signal to people like us who I, I think are well enough read. Anyway, there you go. So here, here roll, roll them, roll them. Uh, uh, Pre-industrial religious experiences you write about in your book, Alan, uh, uh, they understood at one time, and you can see it on the walls of the pyramids, you know, where the pharaohs were imbibing and they were toking up, and there, there was a, a respectable purpose. Yet today, the image of the stoner, like that uh, thing from Ron Mann's documentary, Grass, is so narrow, so prescriptive. What has happened? There's a lot of different reasons why people use intoxicants, but we've constructed intoxicant use in the 20th century, other than alcohol, as just being a decadent, depraved type of activity. It has no social utility. So all the thousands of years of spiritual use of psychedelics and cannabis have just been forgotten or erased. So really our position on drugs is other than alcohol, we somehow distinguish it, no social utility. It can only lead to destruction of the spirit. And that's why I think we don't have a change, a meaningful change in the law, is because the politicians and the general public aren't recognizing that altering consciousness 
is inherently valuable. It leads to further insights. I'm not saying you're going to see God when you take LSD or smoke pot. It's only a pathway. It's the law of diminishing returns. The drugs can get you to taste the divine, but once you've tasted it, you better explore it in a sober state. Alan's book talks about state-sponsored lies and deceit, and, and I think many of us have experienced that. As, as a young person, your, your, your first introduction to the authority of the government and even your parents is bogus in this regard. Have, have you had that experience yourself? Very true. Very true. Uh, there's a, a lot of teenagers out there that have been told that cannabis is an absolutely deadly substance and to avoid it at all costs because it leads to heroin and cocaine and the other substances. And yet they'll try that at a party and find out that, wow, you know, this really wasn't so bad. And uh